thank you, J. Michael Collins. You really need no introduction, but the uh, king of JMC demos. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to how to better the the CEO the head the boss the owner the yeah, let's just say the, the owner. owner it's that's yeah that's that that'll work and then because because I work for the queen and she's in the that's other true bedroom back here, so and I'm we like, all love your queen yeah. she's <laughs> Thank so you. as the as the owner of JMC Demos we just want to chat about demo production in 2024 and kind of what the differences are between now and you know maybe a few years ago and kind of just get your insights from a a particular place of experience. Sure. So um, let's just start with what do you think the role of a demo is in 2024? Is it just for marketing? Is it just to get an agent? Well, you know, my answer to every question in voiceover is it depends. Um, so, it, and it depends on the genre um, in many cases, and it depends on where the talent is in their career, uh, you know, and what their goals are at that particular point in time. So, a commercial demo is generally for getting representation. It's generally to get onto the rosters of production companies and ad agencies, and it's generally to potentially attract work through your own website and through your SEO. Uh, and again, you know, word of mouth if it's happening to land in the hands of certain people that you might know. Um, but a commercial demo is a little bit less in some ways of a marketing tool because um, we don't really market directly to buyers for commercial very much because they tend to use third parties. The ones that don't tend not to have the budget for ProVO in many cases. So they're usually not a great marketing target. So for commercial demo and many other broadcast genre demos, so, you know, for a, an intro narration demo, for a promo demo, um, to some degree for animation, for video games, a lot of it's about just getting in front of the right people, getting on their radar, getting on their rosters. Um, Whereas if you go into things like non-broadcast narration, if you go to explainer videos, corporate narration. Now, corporate's cool because corporate actually is a hybrid. It lives in both worlds a little bit. Your agents, production companies, they do industrial. Even Atlas, CESD, DPN, they do industrials, right? So your corporate demo may not be your sexiest demo, but they want to hear it because it's actually something that they do. So corporate kind of splits the, uh, the, the both directions. But you get to e-learning. You get to medical. Those are all about marketing. Those are all about going out and finding clients directly. Those are all about, your again, your your SEO, those may work on pay to plays. Um, so that's a little bit of a different game. Political demo, same thing. They kind of go both ways. Some agents care about them. Managers like put a few managers working in political more now than they have in the past. Um, and but some production companies handle a lot of political. Then you can go out and do a ton of direct marketing with political as well. So it's really a question of genre. And then also, again, to some degree, where are you in your career? So if you're a brand new talent with a commercial demo, you may be going after one level of agency rep, using it on pay to play, you know, using it to try to get on some production company rosters. Um, if you are an established Established six-figure VO, and you've got several good regional reps. You may be trying to get a commercial demo and a promo demo that really are elite because you want to get that top ten LA agent or that top five New York agent or whatever it might be. And so there may be a very targeted, specific purpose in mind for creating a demo. There are people I've worked with who have made demos in genres that they don't necessarily intend to work in all that much, but they know that if it lands on a certain desk that they're trying to get signed with, that they're going to go, oh, that's really cool, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just one more asset in their package. So it's a big it depends, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's not an unfortunately. I think that's a really great explanation for not just what is the role of a demo, but why do you, why would anybody want multiple demos, which is right. another question. Like that's a really great explanation. So can you tell us how long you've been making demos? God, it's got it's about pushing 15 years now. Um, something like that. Uh, first, uh, I mean, God, I, 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 it was probably 12, 13, 14 years into my career before I even started coaching. Um, and, uh, and the demo thing sort of organically happened. I mean, I, I always shout out Chuck Duran as being the guy who sort of made demo production into an art. He was the first person who made it a kind of a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then a lot of us followed in his footsteps and in, in kind of refining that art over time. Um, but, you know, in the back in the day when I started producing demos, it was really a function of I started by doing mine. Um, and it was often because I would get finished commercials or promos or trailers or whatever back from uh, back from the buyer, right? And they'd send a copy of the work. I'm like, I can't wait to get this and put this on my reel. And then I'd hear it and I'd go, what the fuck did they do? Yeah. 
Right. You know, and whether it was the production, how they how they crunched it up for air or maybe they just didn't take the take out of the session that I would have used. Right. That I would have wanted to represent me and sell me. And that's their great. It's a buyer. Right. So that's that's their discretion. But um, but it might not be what I would want to sell myself with. Right. And so I started going, you know what, with with the wizardry of modern technology, I can probably make something that is going to sound better than the work that I actually have as as a real um, and use that for marketing purposes. So I started doing mine and I think some people heard them and then I was doing a little coaching. They're like, hey, can you do one of those? And I think when I started, I was charging like 300 bucks for a demo. Um, you know, so it was like, it was like, it was just a, I don't know what this is. And then it's sort of all of a sudden people were like, hey, I heard that. I heard that. And then I was like, wait a minute, this is a, this is a business. So <laughs> it, it became a business. I, that's a really interesting evolution, like where you're recognizing that maybe the work that you're doing isn't it's more representative of the brand than it is your abilities. It's right. focused on the brand rather than on what you can do. And right. that's a that's a good reason for having a demo of custom work rather than um, just a reel, which would be more like an example of what you've done. Right, right. And I think, it, you know, having a work reel, there's a site on my webpage. If you go to the recent work tab on my webpage, I've got jobs up there, okay? Mm -hmm. I've got, you know, you can see a lot of videos of stuff that I've done up there. Um, and if you want to see my recent work, there it is. But if I'm giving you, if I'm submitting to an agency or or submitting for management or I'm marketing myself, right, what I want to do is I want to use the stuff that I think makes me sound the best. And I feel like ultimately, I and this is no shade at anybody I work with, you know, as a voice actor, but I feel like I know that a little bit better personally than one buyer might with regard to what they put on the air that they've chosen to, to, to take for me in a session, right? Right. Your goals are very different specifically. Right? Exactly. Um, okay. So because you've been making demos so long and you've seen this evolution, talk a little bit about how the demo has evolved. I mean, it sounds like Maybe 15 years ago or so, it was more maybe compiled work, and now it is more mock work. What else are you seeing? And mock work. Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 no, it's not. And I, I think they're all people, they're fake spots. Well, no, they're not fake spots. I, I, and I'm, I'm stealing, I always steal with attribution. I'm stealing from Cliff Zellman, but I love what Cliff Zellman says, which is that your demo is your promise of what you can do if given the chance, right? The demo is the, it's the work that you want to do, not the work that you're doing, right? Because I've got a whole web page full of the work that I'm doing, right? So um, I'm working on, uh, very rarely do I have anybody else do my, my stuff because I've been doing this for myself for a long time, but I'm currently working on animation. I'm not an animation guy. It's not an area I play. We have a whole demo production arm for animation, but you're working with Matt Curtis, Chris Sharps. We're about to actually make a really big announcement in animation pretty soon. Um, but I'm uh, coaching with somebody in animation, and my team's going to do my demo, and my hands are off of it. And they're they're giving me the copy. They're walking me through it because it's just not the area that I play in all that much. Um, you know, but in terms of evolution, I think that it's uh, – I think what the biggest evolution is twofold. Number one is um, they are demos have become more niche. So if you go back um, 15 years, compilation demos were much more common. Um, mm -hmm. Even even within the broadcast world, you might have a demo that had a commercial, a promo, a concert promo, a TV narration, and a political on it, right? Um, and that's just not a thing anymore because there's so many people with so many hyper focused niche specific demos that you're competing with people really elite talent that have targeted demos that show range and five or six different reads within each genre. And so if you've just got one read to show within that genre, it's not competitive. It's why some of these schools out there that still sell narration demos as these broad things that compile six or seven narration genres, well, even as recently as 10 years ago, that was a thing. That was still okay. Yeah. But today, if you're shopping yourself for e-learning or for medical, you know, or for um, political specifically or whatever, if you don't have all the five or six reads any e learning that there are all the five or six or seven reads in medical that there are on that demo, you're at a huge disadvantage because you're competing against people who do. And the medical buyer, they don't care about your, you know, David Attenborough voice. They don't want to hear your, your documentary read, right? So um, that that's the, one of the big evolutions, I think, is that they have become more niche. The other thing I think is that there are a lot of people who kind of poo-poo demo awards out there. And don't get me wrong, a demo award is not going to get you signed by an agent mm -hmm. unless they're the ones who voted on the demo, which does happen sometimes. OK, but, um, you know, it's it's not going to do a whole lot for your career at the end of the day. Um, but the demo awards have done something that nobody talks about. They created competition among the demo producers and they forced us all to get better. 
And if you listen to the quality of demos today in any genre versus 10 or 15 years ago before rewards for demos started becoming a thing, even among the very best producers, they're dramatically better than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And that's because the fact that we're competing against each other for recognition forced us all to get better at what we do. So the people who poo-poo demo awards, I get it. But at the same time, it's kind of like you don't realize they've actually done a little bit of a service for voice talent in that they've made the quality of what they're getting better because of the competition among producers. And putting it out there where people can see them side by side and compare, and and, and it's always a benefit. Exactly. Um, it's more about education, I think, the awards than anything else. It's a nice way to get the information out there. And it is um, fun yeah. recognition for talent. It's, it it's all in good fun. It is. And and we are in an industry that has very little validation and recognition outside of booking work. So it's always yeah. nice to have a little bit of that. So do you feel like it's um, important for demo producers to niche down to their skill set? It sounds like yes, because like you're saying, you don't do the animation demos. You have somebody else do it within yeah. your team. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, if you're not if you're not competent in a specific area, why would you be producing demos in that area, right? Um, you know, so I mean, the areas that I, there are three parts of this business I don't really play in very much, and that is animation, video games, and audiobooks. Okay, so we have the JMC demos character team, um, and basically all I do when you work with us for for whether it's an animation or a video game demo is I'm essentially just supervising the process and approving the final before it gets released to the talent. Um, but other than that, my hands are are and you're working with my team, we have an audiobooks division that's run by Scott Brick. Okay, so if you do an audiobook demo with us, you're working with Scott top to tail, um, you know, and, and Scott presents me the final and I just give a, a, a blessing on it, essentially, which, how, I mean, how dare I with Scott anyway, I should just let him deliver it directly to the client. But uh, I do want to hear it because my brand's on it, right? So, uh, but but Scott's our guy for uh, for for uh, audiobook demos. And we have a Spanish division, which is run by Juan, Har uh, Juan Carlos, and, uh, I will never say it right, Juan Carlos Hernandez Babic, um, who uh, is a great Spanish talent, and he supervises all of the Spanish de uh, demo production that we do as well. So um, other genres I do play in, so I do produce in those genres, and my hands are typically on the vast majority of that process. But yeah, demo producers should, you know, you, you don't want to be the guy who says stay in your lane, right? right. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, if you're a radio imaging guy and an in-show narration guy, you know, or if you're a, a you know, a animation lady and, and that's all, you, why are you doing you know, e-learning demos, right? Um, and vice versa. If you're a medical narrator, why are you doing commercial demos? So, um, you know, if, if, if you're specialized, you should obviously be producing within whatever your specializations are. Yeah. And if you're going to play in that lane, just make sure you know it. Make right? sure it's good. Yeah. That's the key. Um, so what talent criteria do you require? Oh, sorry. What criteria do you require of a talent before you'll produce a demo for them? Do you require a certain set of coaching or a home studio evaluation, for example? So, well, yeah, I mean, that there the prerequisite at a minimum is that you have ability and you can make it sound good from your home studio. Um, we do have some talent who go to a third party studio if their home studio isn't quite there. Um, you know, that's that's up to the talent to get their home studio ready. Um, but if I feel that the talent is there and they want to go to a third party studio, I've had talent who are in the process of moving or whatever. So I'm, I'm I will obviously test the home studio. And if we're recording from the home studio, it has to meet my standards. If it doesn't, we're either going third party or we have to wait until they put it together. In terms of criteria for ability, though, this is where I may come in kind of in the middle a little bit between different producers in that my criteria is simply that I believe you're ready to book market rate work. Um, and I actually have a clause, and I'm going to read it, then it's in the literature that I send to people um, on being demo ready. And it says, and I'm starting to get so old that the text needs to be bigger. Um, <laughs> but it says, um, it is JMC's policy not to accept anyone for demo production that he does not reasonably believe will see a return on their investment. So that's my minimum criteria, right? I expect you to be in the black on your demo. If you, if you if I don't think you're going to profit, I can't work with you if I think you're going to be in the red, right? Now, you make 2000 bucks profit, I'll sleep at night, okay? Because at least you're turning it into something. But I put in here specifically, that said, do not assume that acceptance is an endorsement that you're ready to drop a demo on the doorstep of the industry's biggest agents. JMC will work with anyone he believes will gain more work from a demo, and that includes newer talent who may be ready for their first small market agent or online casting, as well as the A-list of industry veterans looking for the best production available. Um, and I'm always happy to do a consultation to give someone, if they don't know, an idea of where they fit on that spectrum. Um, but I I will work with anybody I believe will see a return on their investment. That does not doesn't mean you're, you know, VPN ready. Right. 
I like that. I, um, it opens the doorway for more talent to have access to a demo who might not be ready for for agency. For, for, yeah, for, for A-list. I, look, I, I really believe that, you know, if you're ready to book work at fair market rates, if you're booking, you know, out of the GBA guide, out of the SAG guide, whatever, I don't care if that's on voice one, two, three. OK, I don't care if that's through your own marketing. You deserve to have a reel that can represent the quality of, of what you're able to do. Right. That doesn't necessarily mean you're ready for top five rep, but it means you're ready to go out there and book. And most people don't wake up and roll out of bed even after training for a year or two ready for top five rep. So do you still coach yourself or do you outsource all the coaching? I coach less than I used to. Um, if I, I, I have kind of have a rule for if I have anybody who's doing like a, an extended program of coaching with me. Um, I keep no more than five of those people on at any given time because I just don't have the bandwidth to do more than that. Um, I will not work with anybody who I think needs more than 10 sessions. Um, you know, it's, I just, I don't, <laughs> coaching is a money lose. Uh, by the way, here's the yeah. thing, you know, we are always talking about, um, you know, red flags looking out for, for, you know, what, look, if a coach is desperate to take your money for coaching, um, it, I lose money when I do a coaching session. Because I'm not here, okay? Is right. there a profit margin on demos? Sure, okay? But I lose money when I'm doing a coaching session. Even at my headline rate, and demo clients pay less, but even at my headline rate of $300 an hour, I'm losing money. I should be charging five fifty dollars an hour for coaching, okay? I can't. The industry won't sustain that. I'd get run out on a rail, okay? But at the end of the day, um, I lose money when I coach. So if somebody's desperate to take your money for coaching, if it feels like they need to keep their lights on by coaching you... Uh, that's a warning sign, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I keep no more than five people on for, a, you know, for an extended period of time. And by, by that, I mean, you know, usually no more than three months or so. Um, and then I do one-offs with a lot of different people. I have a lot of people who come in who maybe, especially in specialized genres like political um, or maybe they're, you know, they've already got a good commercial demo. They've worked in commercial, but their, their skill set has just – kind of like three years out of date um, and they need like three sessions just to just to kind of dial them in to be ready to to, to be back where the market is. Right. So um, those are the people I love to coach because it's it, it's it's just a few sessions typically and then we're ready to rock and roll. Um, if you need two years of coaching, if you need 50 sessions before you're going to do a demo, please don't call me. Please go somewhere else. Um, you know, I've got a whole list of affiliate coaches I do have uh, who work for us. Um, let me go to that list because it changes. And I don't want to catch myself rattling off names, but I mentioned Scott Brick already. So if you want to work audiobooks, you can work through us with Scott. Uh, Jen Henry for commercial explainer e-learning corporate and medical. Um, Brad Hyland for commercial explainer e-learning corporate and medical. Erica J for uh, commercial explainer e-learning corporate and medical. Um, radio imaging and TV affiliate with AJ McKay. Uh, Kristen Piva for animation. Um, Lynn Norris for audiobooks, accents, and business writing. Uh, Gina Scarpa for commercial characters, explainer, and corporate. Uh, Michael Scott for animation and video game and Bridget Reel for business marketing explainer corporate and e-learning. So they all work under the JMC brand. Um, and you can you can book them all individually on your own too. You don't have to come through me. Believe it or not, I actually don't take a commission when with, with my coaches. So when you work with my coaches, they get paid 100% of what their rate is. I don't take anything off the top. Um, and uh, typically we, we have some newer talent who come in who might work with Brad and then work with Brad, 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 and then they're ready for a demo after working Maybe a little longer with Brad than I would want to work with him, right? Because I don't have the time. Um, and then right. when Brad says, okay, you're ready to rock, then they come and, they, and, and they're and they ready to do their demo with me. So we keep uh, affiliates on for that purpose. But yeah, um, I, I love, look, I love coaching. I adore it. Um, and that's the only reason I still do it. Uh, because if I had any business sense, I wouldn't. Right. It's not a financial uh, benefit as, as compared to the working. Um, it sounds like your list of coaches came straight from like the A-list, right? <laughs> they're they're all amazing. Every single one I know personally is amazing. So um, that is speaks highly to how much you prioritize your talent working with quality coaches. Yeah. So what do you say to the naysayers who think that coaches should just coach and demo producers should just produce demos because there's a conflict of interest there if they're like, oh, I coach you 10 sessions and you get a demo at the end, right. like maybe like such a voice or something like that. Um, what do you say to those people? I say the same thing I say to everybody else on every question. It depends. Um, you know, so uh, there are instances where, you know, look, I, I think the thing people need to watch out for is, is a coach dangling a demo at the end of the process and along the way they're going, yeah, I think you need three more sessions. 
Yeah, I think you still need two more sessions. Yeah, I think you still need five. Look, I I do. There are two. There are two things I will sell anybody. One is a talent evaluation. The other one is my online casting training. Okay, um, you don't need any pre qualification to come in and do either of those things. If I do a talent eval with somebody, um, I've been doing this for a long time. And I don't get it. I don't. They're, they're, I, I, pr- I probably press the refund button on somebody about once a year where I'll do an eval and we'll get in and they'll they'll do a package of stuff or whatever. And we'll get a session or two. In and I just go, oh, shit, that was no, I got that wrong. I'm and then, and then I have to have a very hard discussion where I'm going, I'm going to give you your money back. And here's why, um, you know, and uh, but generally speaking, when I eval somebody, I have a pretty good idea where they fit. Um, so whether you come to me or any of the names I just mentioned or any of the other great coaches and producers out there or casting directors, whatever, if you're not sure, go and get somebody to sit with you for an hour and put you through your paces and run you through a bunch of copy in whatever genre or genres you're interested in, right? Because those who have been in the business for 10, 15, 20 years, we have ears that have developed to the point where we can go, yeah, you know, you a few sessions, you're going to be fine. You're going to be ready to rock. Or this might be a journey for you. Right. Or somewhere in between. Um, and so I think it's very much and it depends in terms of the, the separation of, of church and state. Um, you could make an argument for the the other side of the glass a little bit, but I don't want to make that argument because there are great casting directors and great, you know, ad agency booth directors and people like that who produce demos who, you know, aren't talent and, and they do work on the casting side. And you could argue something there, but but they're really they make really good demos too. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's very much, and it depends. Use your instincts. I mean, uh, you have to look like any service industry and especially entertainment industry, because there are always people trying to sell you a dream. And, you know, if you give me your credit card number, you can make a million dollars, right? Um, just use your instincts, go read the best practices guides that Nava has for coaching and for demo production. Um, talk to people, go on the Facebook groups, ask for references, just do as much research as you possibly can. And you can't always protect yourself. We saw the whole Lisa Biggs thing. You know, you can't see stuff like that coming if somebody's intentionally trying to commit fraud, right? That's right. that's a, a one in a million thing. Um, but you you will get, for the most part, a theme of feedback if you are sourcing opinions from a broad base of people within the industry about the people that you want to work with. And you will start to see patterns of feedback emerge. And that should help you guide your choices and give you an idea of whether or not, you know, you're in the red zone. Yeah, I like that. Follow the patterns of feedback. And I think it's important to... Uh, we- and in my interview with Tina Morasco, she talked about when you're interviewing demo producers, you need to ask them, what do they know about the industry that gives them insight into what belongs on a demo? And sometimes right. that is casting directors and, and it's going to be coaches and it's going to be, it's just really knowing the person and what they have to offer. That's the key. So, Very much so. Um, how important is our custom scripts to you in your process and what does custom scripts actually mean? Can you So I, I think custom, that? custom script, scripts are important um, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, if you are using existing copy from real spots, especially for higher profile stuff, okay, especially for stuff that has gone to air, especially if it's particularly visible, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then we do get into kind of what we're calling fake spots a little bit in the sense that when it lands on the the desk of an agent or a casting director, they go, oh, he, that person didn't do that, um, you know, and then they're comparing you to the person who did. And well, you know what? That person went through an agent, casting director to the buyer, got hired, got in that session, did a good job and went to air, which means that no matter how good you are, you're probably not comparing favorably to that person. So it's not necessarily a great idea to begin with just because the bar is already set so high if you're using something that's actually a a visible campaign or something that's really well known. Um, You know, for less known genres, if you're pulling copy off the internet, look, the one place where we do repurpose copy is corporate, okay? Corporate narration, you have to get the content right. Uh, medical sometimes also. You have to you have to actually get the company's branding and content right, and you can't just make that stuff up out of thin air. So what we do is we'll go on – excuse me, I got the silk off. We'll go on to company websites, or for medical, we'll go into academic journals, right? Um, and we'll take some content, and then we'll repurpose it a little bit to make it flow better for voiceover. So those are kind of a hybrid. But for commercial, you know, number one, you don't want to rip off existing stuff. Number two – um, for an individual talent, okay, the, there is copy 
that will fit your voice, that will fit your style, that will also dovetail with what the market wants, um, that is going to suit you better than it is, you know, the next person who comes in for a demo. And a good demo producer, whether they write the copy themselves or whether they have a team that does that, they will understand at that point in the process, whether they've been your coach or whether they're getting input from your coaches or whether they've just listened to your stuff and put you through your paces, what's going to work for you. And so custom scripts are are meant a number one to represent what is currently booking in the industry. What is they're they're meant to they're meant to mimic, not to rip off, but to mimic the style of reads that are popular. But then they're also meant to show you in the best popular light. And I've heard people go, well, people should use real copy because that's going to show what they can actually do. And well, why would you why would you put yourself at a disadvantage? Um, you know, take take custom copy is going to give you every possible advantage to sound as good and on trend and on point as you possibly can, um, a demo should be a showcase of you at your very best, uh, best possible, best world's, you know, best case scenario against national level production um, with copy that works for you. So, yeah, I mean, I think custom copy is, is uh, you know, it's it's a prerequisite to me for good demo producers in 2024. Um, you will look at everything in this business. There will always be something where it comes across my desk and they go, oh, I did this with this and I'll go, yeah, that's not bad. There are always exceptions. There's no, yeah, I don't think there are a whole lot of hard and fast rules in this business at all. But in general, custom copy is a good idea for demos. And I, um, it's important, I think, that to distinct the distinction. We have come to expect that custom copy means that it's handwritten exactly for you. But you're saying sometimes, especially like for corporate, that it isn't handwritten, it's personalized. So maybe the yeah, so, way to so, it is uh, personalized. Uh, well, so I mean, I, I will say that for every genre except for corporate and medical, Everything that we do is handwritten. It okay. is it is completely custom. Um, corporate narration and medical are the two exceptions where we will scrape some content from corporations or from uh, a medical journal or I, ISI. You can't make up yeah. ISI, right? Um, you know, you make up Not a fake well. drug name and you know <laughs> side effects include Ebola, zombieism, and COVID twenty four, right? Um, you can't you you, you <laughs> it doesn't work if you don't get the facts right. So um, it has to sound plausible. So for those two very specific genres, um, let's call it custom customized copy as yeah. opposed to custom copy, but everything else is handwritten. And the most important thing is, is it fitting? It Does it represent the brand in the current econ the climate, economy, whatever the word is I'm looking for, industry? And does it represent your best Ability. Yeah, and I and I want to throw one other little note on that too, which is that there are some people who get hung up on, and I know I'm probably taking up way more more time in this interview than, than you expected, but um, but there are some people who get hung up on um, that doesn't sound on brand for that company based on their current campaign. Mm -hmm. Their campaign is going to change in three months. You don't know what it's going to be in three months or six months or nine months, right? The idea is, does it sound on brand? For you, does it sound on? Does it sound on trend for a commercial in that sector in the industry right now? Doesn't necessarily have to match a company's current campaign at the moment because you're not trying to book that campaign. You're right. trying to book the work that you want. You're trying to book the aspirational work. You're trying to think where is it going, right? So there's some people who go, "That's not what I'm here." You know, I want to do a Mercedes spot. Um, well, you don't sound like John Hamm. So let's let's figure out how we can skin that cat and make it plausible, but fit your voice and also fit something that the market would want. Maybe it's not what Mercedes is buying right this second, okay? But if you have an agent or casting director listen to it, they go, shit, Mercedes ought to do that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or we could do that for... Lexus or whatever, you know, right? Like, whatever, whatever brand. I'm, I'm saying, don't, don't just. Uh, I think there are some talent. It's interesting because it's often the 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 higher end talent who come and go. Well, that's not quite on brand with what they're doing right now. And I'm like, you're not trying to book their current campaign. That's been booked. That's done. Right? You're trying to show what you can do. You know, so don't don't get don't get stuck in a box. That's my point. Got it. I love that. That's an interesting perspective, um, which is what I expected of you. Interesting <laughs> perspectives. Great perspective to the industry. So tell me. Um, Walk us through the process. Someone comes to you, they've done coaching, like they're, they're they finished their coaching and you're like, okay, it's demo time. What does that look like for the talent? Right. 
So once I agree, once we both agree that they're that they're ready to rock and roll, um, I'm, we're going to do a couple of things. So first off, we're going to sit down and talk about scheduling. Um, generally speaking, if you walk in the door right now and say, I want to do a demo with you, J. Michael, and I'm ready, and we agree that you're ready, um, it's typically about four to six weeks before I'm going to be able to get you in for a, for a recording session. That's the kind of standard wait time. Um, and so uh, what we'll do in between uh, that time and when we first talk is I'm going to ask you for some input on the content that you're going to want to see on your demo. Um, and that input differs depending on what genre it is. If it's commercial, for instance, I'm going to ask you probably for 10 or 15 brands, products, and companies that you like, that you have an affinity for, um, any that you deeply despise. Obviously, we're not going to write anything that's you know just awful on there, but there's some people who hate Walmart or McDonald's or whatever. So um, I'll ask them, do you have any corporations you object to? And we won't use those. Um, and that just kind of, it, it, does, it does two things for me. A, it helps me personalize the demo a little bit, so you'll connect with a copy a bit more. I won't use everything that somebody gives me, I'll sometimes I'll intersperse some of my own stuff, also based around what the market's looking for as well. But it also kind of keeps me from kind of going to the same well of the same, you know, top 20, 30, 40 brands every time. I get people sometimes who send me ideas and I go, oh, that's cool. Or I didn't know that brand. I'm going looking up, you know, now I'm going down the rabbit hole and looking up their stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's really neat, right? Um, and so uh, the talent, you know, that, that interplay I think is great because I get ideas and then I can go off in creative directions when I'm writing that I, I might not have thought of in the first place. So I love that input. If it's political, I'm going to ask you to pick a party and then tell me issues you care about, tell me candidates that you like and dislike that are running in the current cycle, um, and then write accordingly based on that. And again, with other genres, it's going to be you know particular companies, brands, or if it's promo, TV narration, something like that, what kind of shows? If you've worked with Harry Dunn or Tom Pinto or somebody like that, or Joe Sip, right? What kind of shows is your voice right fit for? What have you guys worked on? What you know, What's working? I might even ask your coach uh, for a little input. Um, um, and then we'll write based around that. And so usually the scripting process is going to take me 10, 10 days, 10 to 14 days typically is the turnaround time on copy. So you'll usually get that back with a couple of weeks to review. Um, I get You get as many revisions as you want. Um, one of the things I like to do, and this is um, uh, kind of how I live my life, I'm the last person in the world you ever want to see walk into your hotel or get onto your airplane um, because I've probably paid a reasonable amount of money to be there, and I'm a demanding son of a bitch. Um, but I expect to give that level of service back to the people who work with me too. Uh, and so what that means is that if you have 10 revisions you want on your copy, we're going to make those revisions until you're happy, okay? And then we're then we're going to get into the demo day. Um, I actually like to have the talent record on their end on Zoom. I don't actually love using Source Connect to, re, to, to do demos simply because it has a way of dropping out on – and I love Source Connect, but it has a way of dropping out on the take that I really liked. Um, plus, I like to be able to see you in, in your booth on Zoom, and I just get the visual cues from you that way. And you can do both. But uh, So typically, I just have talent record in their DAW on Zoom. If, they're, if, if it's a talent who I, – I get to, you know, it's funny sometimes as I get um, some real old school, um, you know, big agency talents, but people have been around for 30, 40 years who aren't as comfortable with a home studio tech. Right. Um, and so I'm just like, you know what, go into a studio in LA or New York and have them handle that. And we're just going to work on, on doing the thing. Right. But uh, generally speaking, most talent will record from their home studio in their DAW. Uh, demo day. Um, it's time unlimited. Uh, now that being said, I have a reputation for relatively quick sessions and there's a reason for that. Um, if you you need two and a half hours to do a commercial demo. Somebody hasn't done their job. That's whether that's you, your coach, or me as a demo producer, right? Um, there now. I mean, if you're shooting the shit, if you're having fun, if you're just joking, I've had, I've had, I like Erica J and I when we when we, when I work with Erica, right? Um, she's like driving a sports car. Um, I've had sessions with her that go ninety minutes or two hours that we could have finished in fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just because we're having fun and we're we're getting multiple takes. But at the same time, we're talking, we're doing other stuff. That's fine. Um, but if your session, if if getting the right take and you're doing one demo is taking you. Two two and a half hours, unless you're working with Cliff Zellman, who's got a unusually meticulous process that none of us ever want anybody else to find out about because none of us ever want to work that hard. Um, but uh, but at the end of the day, that that worries me a little bit. So the average session for me for one demo is an hour. Um, but I will block off two typically for each demo just to, you know, time unlimited. If we have, if we get through an hour and a half, it's not quite there yet. And we need to book a second session. We will. Um, so there's never any rush. There's never any, um, you know, any push. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. 
done, let's get it done, right? Um, it's as long as it needs to be. But uh, but yeah, if, if your if your demo session for one of them has taken two or three hours, I I worry about that a little bit. Um, that being said, also with demos, uh, we have two policies that I think have always been kind of standard setting in the industry. One is we will keep working until you're completely and totally happy. So we have an unlimited revisions policy. That doesn't mean nine months later. Um, although if it's a little tweak nine months later, I usually won't charge for that. Uh, but uh, if you come back nine months later and want to redo two spots, there's going to be a spot fee on that. But in the moment, as we're going through that feedback iteration process, even if that's a few weeks, so be it. Um, unlimited revisions. And uh, the other one is we have an unconditional money back guarantee. If you get to the end of the process and you're not happy for any reason, I will refund you in whole with no questions asked. Um, and I think that that is one question you should ask of every demo pr producer. If you're not happy at the end, can I get my money back? And if the answer is not yes, careful. I feel like uh, if I was a mic dropper, that would be a mic drop. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. You, should, you should be able to to say at the end, no, this is not what I feel like is representative of my work. And Exactly. Know. And if you're working with, look, I mean, I, I'm not throwing shade at anybody, but if you're working with somebody as a service provider in this industry who needs your money to keep their lights on or pay their mortgage, are you working with the right person? Right. Should that person even be doing that? Great question. So, excuse me, now I've caught your cough over the, <laughs> Sorry, over it's the a, Zoom. It's a, it's a computer virus. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I've got dad jokes for weeks. Oh yeah, you would love that. You would love my dad. He's full of them. Um, so, do you have set prices for your demos? Are they? Is there? Can you share what those are with us, yes. or is it an it depends? Okay. Yeah. So no, very specific um, for non-broadcast genres, non-broadcast narration, typically. So explainer, corporate, e-learning, medical, telephony. There are a few others that fall into that category. It's twenty one ninety nine, two thousand one hundred ninety nine dollars uh, for any broadcast categories. Um, so anything I didn't just mention, uh, audiobooks also twenty one ninety nine. Um, anything else I didn't just mention is twenty four ninety nine. So two thousand four hundred ninety nine, um, and that's all inclusive of the recording session feedback unlimited revisions and all that good stuff. Um, we haven't raised rates in a couple of years. Um, I should. Will I do it next year? Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Um, I am hope not. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do find, I, I think it's interesting that um, that puts us, I think, high end of middle. Um, there are people who are well over three. So, um, you know, on the flip side, if, if you got somebody, if you got somebody who can produce a, a, a demo for under a grand, you know, or twelve hundred bucks. Um, it's not to say it can't be done. It's just to say, why is their time that inexpensive, right? Because you know, if you're working with a talent, we can sit on this thing and monetize our time between five hundred and a thousand dollars an hour. So, why is somebody's time so inexpensive that they're able to offer something at that price? Now, if they can do it and they can do it in quantity and they can do it great, so be it. God bless them. That'll change the market. Um, but we haven't seen that yet. I think what I um. In what I've been experiencing, it's engineers for, rather than voice talent who are in right. a place where they can offer it at a lower fee, um, but they're not offering that full package. The coaching is right. coming somewhere else. The you know, um, so are you open to collaborating with talent? So let's say a talent comes to you; they've paid a copywriter, they've already got their scripts, they just want you to produce the demo. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're open yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely, and that'll be a different price. Right. That's a case by case basis. Um, we have talent we work with that I just do the copywriting for, um, and so I'll copyright a demo for five hundred dollars, um, top oh, to tail. Right. Any any genre that I'm competent in, I'll do the copywriting on for five hundred bucks, um, and you can go do whatever else you want. You can't call it a JMC demo, um, right. but you can go do whatever else you want with it after that. Um, and we do the same thing with production if you've got copy and everything. But it's the the same little caveat is that we won't necessarily let you put our brand on it unless we're doing it top to bottom. That makes perfect sense. So um, last question, and this is um, an open-ended question. Why should a talent choose to work with JMC Demos specifically? And I, I will say that we've said a bajillion reasons already, but if you just had to give your elevator pitch, what's your elevator pitch? I don't want to give an eleva elevator pitch. I want you to go do your research and decide if I'm the right person for you. Um, you know, go go ask, ask around, word of mouth, listen to our stuff. Um, you know, I, I think the work that we've done over the years speaks for itself. Um, I think an un unconditional refund policy speaks for itself. Um, you know, and if you if you think we're the people that are right for you, if you think I'm the person that's right for you, I'd love to talk to you. Um, if you don't, there there are, you know a dozen plus really good producers out there that I'm perfectly happy to endorse. There is way more demo production 
work out there than I would ever have the capacity to handle, even if we scaled up X10, um, which, God, I would never want to. Uh, you know, so um, if you want to work with me, God bless you. If you don't, please find somebody reputable to work with. Um, I, I don't feel the need to do a sales pitch. Love it. I love it. That is, um, in an essence, why you command this part of the industry so well. But your your work does speak for itself. So thank you, J. Michael Collins, for your time and JMC Demos for the uh, service to the industry. And we will sign off. Well, thank you, Alicia. And thank you to the besties for having me on. And uh, yeah. we, should, we hope you guys have a, a continued ascension into greatness. You guys are doing good stuff for the industry. We appreciate it. Thank you so much.